Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Well, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And today is October 11th, and today we're going to look at Deuteronomy 4.44 through Deuteronomy 5.6. Now, just by way of reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and the theology in that chapter. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes or so every day. So let's get to our reading now from Deuteronomy 4.44 through Deuteronomy 5.6. And Deuteronomy 4.44 through Deuteronomy 5.6 says this, This is the law that Moses set before the people of Israel. These are the testimonies, the statues, and the rules which Moses spoke to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Beyond the Jordan in the valley opposite Beth Peor, in the land of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon, whom Moses and the people of Israel defeated when they came out of Egypt. And they took possession of his land, the land of Og, the king of Bashan, the two kings of the Amorites, who lived to the east beyond the Jordan, from Arior, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, as far as Mount Siron, that is, Hermon, together with the Arabah on the east side of the Jordan, as far as the Sea of Arabah, under the slopes of Pishgah. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statues and the rules that I speak to you in your hearing, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, while I stood between the Lord and you at that time. He declared to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up to the mountain. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Well, this is our reading today from Deuteronomy 4.44 through Deuteronomy 5.6. Now, some Christians think that because we're under grace, the laws of Deuteronomy and Exodus 20 through 40 and Leviticus are not helpful to Christians today. This is because these sections of the Word of God, they devote so much space to expounding the law of the Israelites, which they believe no longer applies to their lives. Paul, however, was convinced in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So the exposition of the law would be included within that all. And so our approach to the Old Testament law in this book is that all of it has relevance to us today. This is because, as Dennis Kinlaw writes, when God spoke from Mount Sinai and gave the Israelites the law, he was not presenting them with rules to be followed. He was revealing his character, his nature, and his will for them. Christopher Wright explains in his book, Old Testament Ethics for the People of God, that we must take into consideration the context of each of the laws and look to see what the objective behind that law in Israelite society was. And then we may apply that objective to our context today. Through the details of the law and its implementation may differ from past times. The theological intention behind the law is maintained. For example, the punishment for adultery, for dishonoring God in worship, and for dishonoring parents, it may differ today from what they were in the Old Testament times. But the Old Testament laws on these sins, they tell us that Christians must abhor them today just as in Old Testament times. The food laws stipulating that certain foods should not be eaten may not be specifically relevant to us. But we will ask why such laws were made and whether there is something that we can learn from them. 
Many stipulations on worship cannot be fully applied by us today. But we can't ask why a worship leader had to offer a sacrifice for himself before leading the people in worship. We can ask what we can learn by the specific instructions given for the selection of people who will look after the maintenance of the places of worship and even the musical aspects of worship. Surely all of this will help mold our attitudes towards worship today. And so we're going to look for the theological and even the moral principles behind the laws listed in Deuteronomy and attempt to apply them to our lives today. Deuteronomy 4.44, it begins the second and even the longest address of Moses. This section describes the laws or even the stipulations connected to the covenant running from chapters 5 through 26. And it's followed by two chapters about ratifying the covenant in chapter 27 and the blessings and the curses related to the covenant in chapter 28. But first, there is the introduction before us in the remaining parts of Deuteronomy 4. Now, this crossing took place here after Moses' death. The introduction first states in Deuteronomy 4, 44 through 45. This is a law that Moses set before the people of Israel. These are the testimonies, the statues, and the rules which Moses spoke to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Law here is the Torah, which is a general term for the whole law. Testimony, statutes, and rules refers to the different specific stipulations of that law. These two verses introduce what is going to follow. Verse 46 tells us where the sermon was given. Beyond the Jordan in the valley opposite Beth Peor, in the land of Sion, the king of the Amorites who lived at Heshbon, whom Moses and the people of Israel defeated when they came out of Egypt. This was also the place where the first speech was given, according to Deuteronomy 3.29. Next, there is a summary of the victories won just prior to the time of the address and the geographical areas conquered in verses 46 through 49 of Deuteronomy 4. These details are condensed from Deuteronomy 3, 8 through 17, where the conquest of the Transjordan was described. The victories that God gave the Israelites are the basis of giving the covenant stipulations or laws. Now, the point is going to be made once more just before the Ten Commandments are listed in Deuteronomy 5, 6. Now, Moses' second address begins with a concise statement on what to do with the law, saying this, And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. Moses summoned all Israel for this exposition of the law. So what Moses is talking about is relevant for all the people. When it comes to vocation, there are different callings to different people, with some giving some time and others, like the Levites, giving much more time to God's work and perhaps having more constraints on what they can do and what they can't do. But when it comes to obedience to the law, there are not two callings. All are called to be totally obedient to the Lord. Those in situations where complete obedience is difficult are not left off the hook. They need to grapple and they need to ask how they can be totally obedient to God in their situation, in their times. And if they cannot be totally obedient, they need to change their uh, situation. Now Moses says this, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak to you in your hearing today in Deuteronomy 5.1. There are at least 23 references to the people hearing the word of God in Deuteronomy, with 8 in chapter 5 alone. The solemn formula, Hero Israel, it appears five times in Deuteronomy at the start of important sections, like in 5 1, 6 4, 9 1, 23, 27 9. So hearing from God was very important to these people as they did not have idols and other physical objects can be seen to represent God. Though Yahweh cannot be seen, unlike other gods, he can be heard. And it is sad that, unlike in earlier years, the Ten Commandments are not read often when Christians gather. Next, the Israelites are to learn the laws of the Lord according to verse 1. Some people who have an almost magical view about how God speaks to them, they think that studying the word carefully to ascertain the meaning of the text is somehow unspiritual. This is not so with the living word of God, which is fully living and active. 
during the orientation for new students at Fuller Seminary, the president of the seminary, Dr. David Hubbard, uh, mentioned this, that, that we must learn to view study as worship. One of the most learned New Testament Greek resources available today, the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology. It begins with the words of the famous British biblical scholar, Sir Edwin Hoskins, when he says, bury yourself in a dictionary and come up in the presence of God. So today we go to the study of the word with a desire to be with and to be instructed by God, who is both our loving Savior and our Supreme Lord. Those who hear without learning, they fall into several categories. Some hear from one ear and let it go out the other. They are like the seed that fell on the road in the parable of the sower. Now, preachers today face the great danger of taking the message in through our ears and then proclaiming it with our mouth without letting it truly go in and change our behavior. Anne Bradstreet has said, many can speak well, but few can do well. We are better scholars in theory than how we practice. Others hear the word are even deeply moved, but it does not affect their behavior. You know, we've all seen, if you've preached or taught the Bible, you've seen people move to tears as a result of hearing God's word proclaimed. But after some time, they went back to their former life of disobedience. The message touched their emotions, but it did not influence the will so as to make the person move along the path of obedience. Many go to the Bible for an emotional high, some inspiring thought, or some promise that they can claim to calm their troubled minds. And indeed, the Bible has this effect upon us. But we also go to the Bible as students wanting to learn to live. Even deep study can be an experience of worship if we always go to the Word of God with the desire to learn and obey the Word. Now, after surveying the use of the Hebrew word translated learn in the form that it's used here, Eugene Merrill concludes that learning described here is clearly then more than academic. It must impact and change life. So our verse says you shall learn them and be careful to do them in verse 1. That is to say, once we encounter the familiar word shamar, which carries the meaning pay careful attention to. Now we saw in Deuteronomy 4.9 how Moses asked the people to be careful to remember the great events of history. In Deuteronomy 4.23, he spoke about being careful not to forget the covenant and ended up making an image. Now God talks about being careful to do the commands. The same charge is presented again in Deuteronomy 5.32 and Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 6 3. In some religious traditions in uh, the, certain parts of the world, preachers are not bound to practice everything their scriptures teach. That is not so in Christianity. Here are some ways in which we can approach the task of obedience conscientiously. First, we, we take careful note of what makes us disobey and what leads us to disobedience and plan how we're going to avoid those. Uh, acts of disobedience. Second, we find ways to do some of the hard things th uh, the life of obedience includes. Third, we constantly pray for the strength to obey, especially mentioning our vulnerable areas to the Lord. Next, we remain accountable to fellow Christians in our local churches who we can trust and share about our behavior in our weak areas. Lastly, the moment we fall into sin, we plead for forgiveness, naming the sin, and asking God for strength not to fall again by confessing our sins, as 1 John 1, 9 says, and casting ourselves upon the perfect spotless righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. Now, verse 2 of chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, it reminds them of their covenant relation with God and of the day that covenant was first made. When it says this, the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Now, we looked at the need to remember our covenant when we looked at Deuteronomy 4.23, but let me simply mention here that Christians can't go on acting any way they like or living however they want. They are bound by a covenant. In Deuteronomy, the primary emphasis when talking about the covenant is obedience. With Abraham and the other patriarchs, the emphasis was on the promises of God. Now, many of those promises have been fulfilled, and with the conquest of Canaan, the biggest one would be fulfilled. And it's important to emphasize both obedience and the promises of God. But after seeing God do so much to fulfill those promises, we must put our major emphasis on living how God wants us to live. Verses 3 through 5 describe the covenant making process at Mount Horeb, a major aspect of which was God speaking to the people. 
Verses 3 and 4 may sound incorrect to us when they say, Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire. But they were not there at that time. Their ancestors were the ones who were there. But the ancestors also did not speak face to face with God. Deuteronomy 5.5 5 says, It was Moses who went up to the mountain and spoke with God, for they were afraid because of the fire. This is a rhetorical device to highlight the corporate solidarity that the people had with their ancestors. The experience of the ancestors was so real to their children that it was as if they were there too. And so when Moses was speaking face to face with God, it was as if they were speaking because he was their representative. Because they were there in that sense, it is a personal thing to them because of their solidarity with their ancestors and with Moses. Their covenant was personal in application and corporate in scope. This is a key aspect of biblical religion. We are individually responsible for our behavior. We must individually accept the covenant and believe it. As the old saying goes, God has no grandchildren. The law does not consist of an abstract set of principles, but is a personal message from God with whom we also have a personal relationship with him because of Christ. It was intended to become personally internalized in our lives so as to change the way we think and act. But as we live out the law, we are one with our community and we share together in their experience. Through stories from the history of our spiritual ancestors, parents need to give their children this sense of they are part of the larger body, but they also must teach their children that they are personally responsible for their actions. With verse 6, we begin uh, God's words of giving the law. He starts in a way that is very typical for God when establishing or even confirming covenant relationship with his people. It appeals to God's saving acts when he says in verse 6, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And the way God is described, he says, I am the Lord your God. It has a bearing on our approach to the law. The Lord of the universe, our God, has given these commands to us. Today, we may be afraid to follow God's law for fear of displeasing our peers, our leaders, or wicked people. And yet, by following the law, we may forfeit some material or even social blessings. But you see, God is greater than all these people, and he rules all of history. The boy who has beside him a strongly built brother, three years senior to him, will not fear the bully one year senior to him in school. The knowledge that these are the commands of the Lord of the universe gives us courage then to obey. And verse 6 also teaches us that the law is founded upon God's saving acts. The commands are given after God brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The Old Testament is a story of God's redemptive history. God first saves us, and the laws are a consequence of that salvation. They help us continue in the life with which God has gifted us. In other religions, the gods show people how to live, and that way of life is primary to that religion. In biblical religion, what is primary is the way to life through the salvation that God gives. Often we hear people say that all religions teach basically the same thing, how to be good. Well, not biblical religion. Biblical religion is founded upon God's act of redemption. The law flows from that understanding. Law follows gospel. That is true of the Old Testament. God took the initiative to save the Israelites before giving them the law. And so the law is contrasted with the house of slavery in verse 6 of Deuteronomy 5. The law is not intended to enslave, but to enhance the liberated life. We often hear people say that in the Old Testament, salvation is by works, and in the New Testament, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. But actually, technically, grace was operating in primary all along in God's dealing with his people, even in the Old Testament. And when God appears to us through the law, he does so as the one who loves us and has won our freedom. Since the coming of Christ, this understanding has an even deeper meaning as we now see God as the one who won our freedom by giving us his own son to be a sacrifice for our sins. Without this attitude, we would not be able to see the law in the way the Bible intends us to see it. Our obedience to the commands is an expression of our love for God. Deuteronomy 4, 4 4-6, it shows how love for God motivates our obedience to God's word. Doing something for somebody you deeply love is a delight. 
Now, this is how the psalmist refer to the law of God. Psalm 119 mentions delighting in God's law ten times. When we obey the Ten Commandments, we are doing something we delight to do, for we are deeply in love with the God who gave us these commands, and before doing so, gave himself to rescue us from slavery to sin. These commands don't blind us. They enable us to go on living in the liberty that the one who gave the commands won for us. To sum it up, our obedience to the law is a joyful response to the God who has loved us and redeemed us. Because the law is a word from our loving Redeemer, it has a sweet sound to it. Like the psalmist were to delight in it, just as I delight to hear the voice of my spouse over the phone when I'm traveling. This obedience is carried out within the context of a community of people who are similarly thrilled by the fact that God has been merciful to them on account of Jesus Christ alone. And it's clear from the references to the Ten Commandments in the Word of God that they had a very special place in biblical religion. They are sometimes referred to by a special name, such as the Ten Words, which is usually translated as the Ten Commandments or the Words. The word Decalogue, which is often used to refer to the Ten Commandments, it comes from the Greek meaning the Ten Words. This is the only material in the Bible inscribed on two tablets of stone by the finger of God. Now, we're going to discuss the unique signature found at the end of the record of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5.22 when we get to that verse. So, the Jewish and even the Christian traditions are right in giving the Decalogue an exalted place. It's dangerous to say that some passages in the Word of God are more inspired than others. Some people speak of the canon within the canon. And yet, Paul, as I discussed earlier, speaking about the whole Old Testament and today the whole Word of God, to be clear. In 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training of righteous. And so the importance of the Decalogue is that it is a summary presenting the basic principles that govern the whole law. The rest of the laws of the Old Testament derive from the Decalogue. Of course, the Ten Commandments were given into a specific historical situation, in which, which is described in uh, the Torah. Therefore, we're going to study it the same way that we study the rest of the law. We're going to look for theological principles behind each of the commands, and from those, we're going to see how we can apply the command today. And because the Decalogue consists of general guidelines that provide the base for other laws, we can see that all the commands apply today. And it's often been pointed out that the Decalogue can be divided into two parts. The first part, covering the first four commands, presents vertical issues. That is, how we relate to God. The second part, covering the rest of the commands, presents horizontal issues. That is, how we relate to other human beings. And it's most significant that when Jesus gave his two great commandments in Matthew 22, 28, Jesus' great and first commandment was, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind in Matthew 22, 37. His second one was this in Matthew 22, 39. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Christopher Wright says that the sequence in which the commands appear in the Decalogue may suggest priority. The highest priority is relating to God. Next comes relating to other human beings, such as family members, the society in which we live, and our neighbors. Third comes property. It seems that today we have reversed this order. Today, wealth is the most important value in life. Then comes people, and God is generally ignored. While the Decalogue begins with the positive affirmation of God's deliverance, Eight of the Ten Commands themselves are negative. The only positive ones are the Fourth Command about remembering the Sabbath and the Fifth about honoring parents. But the Fourth is also largely negative into prescribing that the people are not to work on the Sabbath. The positive salvation is what is most important in our lives. But we must remember that there are many things that we do not do as redeemed people living in a fallen world. Therefore, the negatives are also very important. But to those who love God and who relish their salvation, the negatives are not viewed as a burden. They are meant as a glorious way to a strongly positive end. They help us get closer and to remain close to the one who is the most important person in our lives and with whom we have a love relationship that is the most enjoyable thing in life. So these negative commands are a means to further liberation for us. They free us in order to achieve our goals, just as giving up heavy and cumbersome clothing frees a runner to run as fast as they can. 
However, for those whose primary goal in life is not knowing and even pleasing God to those who are not secure in their enjoyment of salvation, these become burdens and even apparent restrictions to freedom. Therefore, today, when somebody recalling the old version of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not, it is usually with a negative connotation. But those who are really free are not those who have won their freedom to do this or that. It is rather those who are free not to do some things. They have come to the state where they do not need this or that for satisfaction. Therefore, they can forgo anything so long as that does not hinder their walk with God. For example, if an unemployed Christian has to lie to get a good job, uh, but they refuse to lie and chooses to forgo the comfort, the status, and the security of having a job because they know that lying would displease God. True, having a job solves a lot of problems, but having God w- with us enables us to live at peace amid our problems. Next, somebody has insulted a Christian's wife and they feel they must get even by insulting the person who uh, insulted that person's wife. But you see, they're unwilling to go without that satisfaction and honor because God has asked us to leave those matters settled. He has the deeper satisfaction of pleasing God, though he misses the shallow and even the temporary satisfaction in defending the family honor according to a warped sense of values. So giving something up so we can remain firm in the life of enjoyment with God is therefore not a big deal for the Christian. We must count the cost and follow the Lord in all of life. Christopher Wright um, points out that the Decalogue was a summary of certain fundamental kinds of behavior that either required or prohibited on the authority of the God by whose grace and power Israel existed. He says it was not a criminal law code because it does not give detailed specifications of penalties. The Decalogue, they gave principles and the laws worked out the details. Wright points out that all the laws with the death penalty can be related to the Decalogue. Now, the death penalty shows how serious the breaking of the covenant was and how that affects the whole community. Though all the crimes requiring the death penalty can be traced back to the Decalogue, not all the commands in the Decalogue bring the death penalty. In fact, coveting does not bring with it the penalty at all. And yet the command about coveting is very important because it shows that a person could be thought of as morally guilty before God with having, without having committed an external, judicially punishable offense. Now, Wright shows how Jesus applied this principle to other commands when he extended the understanding of murder to being angry with one's brother in Matthew 5, 21 through 24, and adultery, which is looking at a woman with lustful intent in Matthew 27 through 28. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and today is October 11th, and we've looked at Deuteronomy 4, 44 through Deuteronomy 5, 6. Until tomorrow, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.